Helps if you turn the microphone on. Hello! Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to be here with you all today. My name is Paula Croxon, um, and I... Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I am the Director of Public Programs here at the Zuckerman Institute. Uh, and I'm very excited to introduce today's event. Um, we have had Miguel Zenon um, with us as our jazz artist in residence for almost two years now. Um, I know, <laughs> what a privilege. Um, and this is going to be um, the very last event that he does with us here at the Zuckerman Institute, but not our last event with him as artist in residence, um, because there will be one more. It's going to be at the Hispanic Society on June 18th. Um, and please check back on the Zuckerman website very soon to hear more about that event. But for now, I want to talk about today's event, um, which is going to be absolutely wonderful. Um, so in addition to Miguel, our jazz artist in residence here, um, we also have, I think, four-time Grammy Award winner, drummer Antonio Sanchez. And they will also be joined in conversation by Zuckerman Institute scientist, Rachel Fraser. <laughs> Rachel herself is a jazz musician. Uh, she plays the jazz French horn, um, and we might get to hear a little bit about that as well. Um, so without further ado, please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to Miguel Zenon.
Thank you all so very much. Uh, thank you, Antonio, man. It's such a pleasure to play with you. Antonio Sanchez. Come on. Um, anyway, happy to be here and happy to get to do this uh, uh, with some, like, and, and also open the doors for some people who come into the building. It's really, uh, uh, it's been a really amazing experience for me to be able to do this now for almost two years and, and be part of this, everything that's happening here, meet all the great people here, and, and it's, uh, it's a real treat, you know? Um, so anyway, uh, uh, we've had a couple of these events already uh, with a few friends and drummers and stuff, and um, and I think uh, the idea is to maybe talk about rhythm uh, both from a musical performance type of perspective and also uh, maybe try to get a deeper, a little deeper into it conceptually. I mean, we're musicians, uh, obviously, and we're going to talk a lot about music, but I'm sure that at, as with the other events, we'll find a lot of common grounds and, and things we can kind of connect together um, and share together. So I think uh, the first thing I, I wanted to talk to you, Antonio, maybe uh, to get a, uh, maybe get a little bit into, um, well, Antonio and I, just give you a little background, we've been playing together for a very long time, we actually, we actually went to school together, uh, at college together, and I remember, um, you, you don't know this, of course, but I remember being at, at Berkeley and going to someone's recital and like sitting right next to the drums. <laughs> And like just being kind of mind blown by like everything that was going on, and and Antonio was playing like like ten different things at the same time, and I was like kept going, I was like this is just one guy playing all that stuff. I was just looking at your legs and your arms is incredible, you know. Um, uh, but it was also you know musicianship and the fact that you know he was a fellow Latin American musician. He was really, it, you know, it 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 really um, there was a, a kind of instant connection for me. Uh, to Antonio even before meeting him and eventually getting to play with him and becoming uh, close friends and collaborators over many, many years now. Um, but I, I wanted to maybe ask Antonio if you could kind of break down for us a little bit about your background. I mean, you, you're from, from Mexico City, uh, but maybe uh, your early experiences with music, which I know were not necessarily jazz oriented, uh, and how that kind of, you know, uh, fed your development going forward, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, it's great to be here, always with my brother, Miguel. And uh, I apologize, my uh, my voice is a little weird right now, but it's really sexy, so I'm, <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with that route, speak very softly. So, um, I started playing drums when I was five, and um, I, the way it happened is my mother, Susana, has a brother, Nacho. Nacho had a girlfriend, Anna. Anna had a brother, Fito, and Fito was a drummer. <laughs> and once, one day, I went to their house and I saw, it was actually a Ludwig kit, a Vista Light drum set, like transparent, like the one John Bonham used to play. And, and that was it for me. I was just hooked. Just the, just the sight of the, the thing. It looked like a spaceship. And it was just so cool. And then I, I hit it one time because the the sticks were there so i i hit it and then nacho uh, sorry fito came running down the stairs and he saw me I was like oh check this out and i remember he he played a whole lot of love by led zeppelin he actually put the the lp and played along to it and i was like oh my god this is the best thing ever so since i was five i was started i started playing rock my favorite bands were the beatles the Rolling Stones, everything that my mom listened to, basically. Uh, the Who, uh, Led Zeppelin, Janis Joplin, The Police, Rush, all, gr all great bands. <laughs> I see we have a Rush fan here. Yeah, no, I mean, they're, they're all great bands that had great drummers, so I, I was always attracted to, to that sound, you know? It was just not... Not just timekeeping, it was just more than that. Um, and I stayed doing that for a long time. And then one day I saw the movie Amadeus and it blew me away. And I thought, I want to learn how to do that. Of course, that was 
a little foolish of me thinking that I could learn to do what Mozart was doing. But I, but I really wanted to give it a shot. So I started uh, studying classical piano, went to the conservatory, and I went into this whole other world, uh, analyzing, you know, Mozart scores and and Alvan Berg and, and and playing Chopin and Debussy and stuff like that. That really, at that moment, I saw no connection to what I was doing in the drums. And then later, I discovered Chick Corea, Chick Corea Electric Band, that led me to fusion. Um, great bands, Mahavishnu Orchestra, uh, John Schofield with his uh, fusion band. Um, and slowly, I kind of went, came into, into jazz through the back door, basically. You know, I didn't discover Miles. And I, as a matter of fact, my mom tried to play me an Art Blakey record while I was heavily into Rush and the police. And she played it for me, and I was like, no, this, this kind of sucks. You know, and in the moment, I had no, you know, no idea that years later I was going to go back and try to figure out what Art Blakey was doing. But I was just not ready, you know, for, for that. And um, I discovered, you know, the, the other jazz great drummers, uh, Philly Joe Jones, Roy Haynes, Elvin Jones, Tony Williams, you know, the, the usual suspects, Max Roach, way later. And, uh, and then I, you know, I always loved improvising. So even though I was, I was playing rock, improvisation was always a big part of, of my life. I would just sit and just drum. You know, I didn't call it improvisation. I would just sit on my drums and just play for hours and record myself. And um, so when, when I started getting more into jazz, then I started realizing that I had been doing a lot of those things for a long time, but I hadn't really thought of them at all in the same way that I was being kind of retaught how to do some of those things. And uh, then I started making the connection between what I learned in classical music and improvisation and how that could help me improvise better. And basically what I've been really, really getting into for the last you know, a number of years is storytelling, you know, how to tell stories while you're improvising. And it could be when you're with a band or when I'm by myself, I like to do a lot of long uh, drum improvisations. Um, since I did the, the movie Birdman, I do that live. And then at the end of the movie, I thought, you know, the, the auditorium is packed with people. So I'm just going to keep on going for, and I started with five minutes, 10 minutes. And then by the end, I was giving them like 20 minutes of just solo drums after the movie. And then I would talk to people, and it was really cool because a lot of people, if you think about it, have never heard a drum solo for more than a few seconds their whole life. You know, in what context do you usually use, uh, you know, hear drum solos? Like in pop music, you never hear a drum solo. Unless you like jazz, you never really hear a drum solo. So it was very cool for people to tell me that they had no idea that drums could do that. You know, that it could be an actual instrument that played melodies and played motifs and ideas and that could tell a story. So that, that has been my main mission for, for a long time, just trying to figure out the best way on how to tell stories, how to think about improvisation, how to organize my thoughts in real time, um, and little tricks that I force myself to do, which you know, are basically how good music is composed and improvised, which is motivic development, living space, dynamics, repetition, you know, how great things are composed or improvised, basically. You know, and that's when I started realizing the connection between, for example, Mozart. You know, that he would grab, bam, 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 and then do five movements of that. You know, with, with that, you know, how do you do that? And to me, that's that's the most fasc fascinating aspect of improvisation. How you can start with absolutely anything. Anything can become an idea. The trick is, what are you going to do next? 
you know, and how are you going to connect the, the ideas? Uh, and how are you going to talk about the same thing so that you guys know what I'm talking about? Uh, because this can be so abstract, you know? So I want to make it crystal clear, drill it into my brain and into your brain so that you can say, okay, I understand what the, the main idea is. And then from there, it's obvious that he starts you know, adding this and then adding that. And I, sometimes I see it as a memory game. You know, like, remember what you did so that you can bring it back later. You know, it's like having a conversation. Um, I've been known to smoke a little bit of pot sometimes. And <laughs> where I'm going with this is that, <laughs> yeah, the point is that sometimes, like, you're rambling. You know, you're... Like, you have all these ideas that you want to express, and then all of a sudden, you remember what you were talking about because you forget for a little while. Like, oh my God, what, why, was, why was I saying that? And then you remember, and then you bring it all around, and then it all makes sense. So I try to do that. I don't smoke pot when I play. But I, I try to do that. Try to remember everything I was saying, then kind of ramble on, and then bring it back home. You know, because to me, that's improvisation. You're home, and then you start putting one foot outside of your house, and then look at your garden, then you come back home, you know, then go past the fence, look at the street, you know, and you, you have all these things that you're trying to build, you know, constantly. And the way to, to build new things for me is daring to literally play anything. Anything, and then uh, try to figure out how to to turn that into a story. So um, one thing that I always, when I do clinics, I always talk about the game that I used to play with my mom when I was a kid, which is the random line concept, where you have a piece of paper, two players, and I was a kid, so you have a pen, and then somebody draws a random line. It could be anything. You're you are not supposed to think what it is, what the line is. It could just be a squiggle. And then you pass it to the next player, and then you have to make sense of that line. And then you complete it, and then you put two little wheels, and blah, 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 and then, ah, it's a car, right? So from that random line, you build something uh, that is not subjective. So that's what I try to do when I play. I literally try to throw anything that, without thinking, and then the thinking starts right after that. You know, how can I start, you know, adding things to this, um, developing it, establishing it, varying it, how many different ways can I, can I do that? So that's been uh, a, a real passion of mine for, for a long time now. That's great. And that's, I mean, there's so much there really that we could kind of dig into from the creative aspects uh, of improvisation uh, and, and sort of like the, 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 the systematic idea of like, uh, seeking out motifs and 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 you know exploit exploiting them uh, in a in a creative way to like musical DNA and how that influences everything else. Um, but one one thing that I wanted to ask before we get into that, which I'm sure we will uh, uh, later on, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, about practice. Uh, one thing that that I think is interesting to think about, especially when you play an instrument and you're playing it creatively, you're improvising with the instrument. Of course, the instrument is 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 kind of like in the way, in a way, right? Like you you do you have this thing that you kind of have to get your ideas filtered through this uh, this outside thing, uh, saxophone or drums or piano, you know. Um, and in order to get those ideas to flow, you have to be able to you have to be good at the instrument. You have to get to a point where you can actually manage the instrument, and, and it becomes more of a, a vehicle than a than an obstacle, I guess, you know. Um, so I wanted to ask you, uh, since you were talking about improvisation, and I feel like like being able to, to manage your platform is really integral to be able to improvise at the level that you were talking about. Um, was like what was practice like for you early on, right? And how did that develop over time up to today, right? I mean, you could kind of give us a summary because I mean, one thing that is obvious uh, when I hear when I hear you play is like you know facility in the instrument, 
right? Like facility and the mm. instrument, uh, independence, you know, all the stuff that you think about when you think about about like a really uh, like uh, like gifted, technically gifted drummer. I hear when I when I hear you play, but obviously that didn't happen overnight, right? Mm. That took time and took effort, uh, and then eventually going from like having that facility and having that to like saying like, okay, so maybe that won't be all I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna use that to my advantage as an improviser, creative musician, that kind of thing. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I see, you know, what you're talking about as speech. You know, if you're struggling with how to pronounce letters, it's gonna be hard to say words. Or imagine if every time you're gonna walk, think that way obviously we don't think that way because we do it so much and same thing with speech so there are th uh, there are things that in your instrument you should not have to think about because if you're worrying about how you're grabbing the stick or how you're going to do a sticking uh, then the moment is gone and then you can't, you know, you can't improvise uh, if you're still at that level. And, and actually, let me take that back, because you can improvise. Uh, and one of, of my favorite things to do, like when I do a drum clinic, and, you know, a lot of times in these clinics, there are beginners and there are like very advanced people. And I'll just bring somebody that is absolutely random um, to the drums. And then I asked them to play anything. And the cool thing about this exercise is that it can be uh, applied to anything, to anybody, any instrument, any level. So I, I have them play something, then stop. Remember what you played. If you can't remember what you played, you're already ahead of yourself. So play something simple. And then a lot of times I get kids that you know have been playing for just a few months, and then they play something really simple, and then, okay, repeat it. Okay, now repeat it one more time and then add something at the end. You know, and then do it softer, do it louder, do it slower, do it faster. And then you can start seeing the audience going like, oh, I'm following, I'm following what he's doing. You know, so it's so simple. Um, but obviously the more uh, tools you have technically, the more complex you can get in your in your speech you know it's like people that, that have really good vocabulary and handle uh, on on words and 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 language then the way they can talk it's you know you're you're drooling because it's so beautiful you know so that's what i'm trying to achieve in my instrument so in the beginning uh, i would just like to play you know just enough so that i could play along to ringo star and then enough so that i could play to john bonham and then when I started getting more into Neil Paird and Rush, for example, it started getting harder. So then luckily around that time, uh, drum videos started getting popular. And, and the first Dave Weckl video that was available in Mexico, I just studied that like, you know, I, I was glued to, to, to the TV, just making sure that my hands just looked like his. And he was a really good, good teacher. He would explain things really well. So I, I was self-taught, but I was really observing closely, you know, how to do things. And, and then, you know, you start getting better and you start repeating. And then I went to Berkeley. I started talking to other drummers. And then little by little, um, my technique started getting better and better. But having said that, I had absolutely no concept on what to do with, with that technique once the technique got better. So I was having, uh, you know, I had my double bass drum pedal and I had a big drum set with a bunch of cymbals and stuff and, and I was just, you know, into chops at that moment. I wanted chops and, and I was into impressing other drummers. And then when I got to Berkeley and, and I was, you know, because in Mexico a lot of my friends used to tell me, man, you're amazing. And then, of course, who am I not to believe what my friends tell me, right? <laughs> so then when I got to Berkeley, I was like, yeah, I'm amazing. And I'm going to kick ass. And I had the same mentality of just showing off and, and playing um, a lot of stuff. And I remember my, my first semester, uh, 
I was walking around the hallways and somebody, a, a drum teacher, Ron Savage, saw me with my um, stick bag and he said, oh, you, you play drums? Do you want to play? Because our eighth semester bebop ensemble is playing now and the drummer didn't show, off, show up. And I was, it was my first semester, so I was like, man, this is my chance to shine, of course. And then I brought my kid, which I had in this huge locker, and it was a, like a rock fusion kid, big drums, shiny cymbals. I had a lot of stuff. And I was already late to the ensemble, so I started setting up all my stuff. And of course, I wanted to shine, so I made sure I said the last, every cymbal I had. And the kids were already playing, and they were looking at me like, what the hell are you doing, you know? But I was thinking, man, it's going to be so worth it. Just wait. <laughs> and then I set the whole thing up, and then Ron puts a, a chart in front of me that I had never really studied drum charts before, but I knew how to read music because I had been in the conservatory. But I saw a melody, Pent Up House, and I was like, okay, it doesn't look so hard. And it said swing, and I knew swing was Chang, Chang Galan, two and a four. So how difficult can that be? And then I started playing. Uh, to begin with, you know, he goes like, ready? One, two, one, two. And in my world, this was always one and three. So to begin with, I was like, wow, the system is different in this country. You know, <laughs> they, they count backwards. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. I mean, I had no idea whatsoever. And I started playing, and as soon as I started feeling comfortable, then I started just blowing and blowing and blowing. And, and to make a long story short, he started, the, the drum teacher, Ron, started removing my drums one thing at a time <laughs> as I was playing and, and left me with just bass drum, hi-hat, snare drum, and, and my right cymbal. And then he was like, okay, now solo. You've been wanting to solo the whole class, obviously, so go ahead. And, you know, it was like if I had woken up from a comma, comma for 10 years. I mean, it was the most depressing day of my life and the best day of my life because I realized how far I was from actually improvising. You know, so I had technique, I had chops, but I had no conception on how to organize my, my ideas at that point. So my, my uh, um, mission in that moment became, okay, translate your technique to improvisation, to real improvisation. And, and then most of it came from listening to other people. You know, that's, uh, I remember when I listened to Tony Williams the first time with um, Miles, George Coleman, and Ron Carter, that record, and Herbie my funny Valentine, four and more. That was the first, you know, it, it had the same impression on me as when I heard The Police for the first time or Led Zeppelin for the first time. It was like, I don't understand this, but it's incredible. But it was so much deeper, of course, you know, and to get to that level of improvisation, I knew I had a lot of work to do. But mainly, um, I, I tried to study in a smart way because as you can remember at Berkeley, you know, you have so many other things to do. I remember there were kids that would study, practice eight hours a day, and I would see them all the time, and I would see them in the practice room, and they sounded incredible. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, what am I doing here? You know, these, these guys are just ridiculous. And then I would see them play, and they sounded horrible. They sounded like they were practicing, you know? And they sounded kind of like I was sounding. So I, I made a, a pact with myself to, okay, you have to, Practice what you really suck at, you know, instead of pl playing the same things that made me feel good, you know, because I, I knew how to play them. So playing slow tempos, a lot of swing, uh, bebop vocabulary, uh, playing over forms, you know, singing the form where you're playing, all, all the things that I, I had never done. And I, I had no idea. I didn't know, even know what a standard was. So I, I had to start from scratch in that, in that way, but luckily all the technique that I had allowed me to catch up quickly. That's awesome. Um, kind of a side question to the same, along the same lines. Um, I mean, we talked about, about, you know, technique in terms of like technical ability in the instrument and, and dexterity and being able to play fast and clear or, or slow and clear, but just like just control of the instrument. And uh, I mentioned this earlier, 
but um even even you know for the standard of, of of really amazing drummers i've always felt like the way you deal with independence around the kit you know like like you know being able to separate limbs and 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 have the and i was talking about it earlier when i heard you play the first time it really struck me as as something that was really mind blowing you know um and i'm wondering if you could give us a little just a little sort like short survey on on how you developed this initially you know like like what were the first couple of times you say okay so this is something that works mm. and and it comes i mean not, i'm not gonna say easy but it's, it came naturally you know yeah well independence is something because i started really getting into afro-cuban music um, that I discovered it was v incredibly challenging and really cool, you know, because in, in Afro-Cuban drums, you're trying to replicate what a few people do with percussion. So then you have to learn all these different parts. And once I, you learn the parts, then you have to make them feel good. And you have to, of course, learn the vocabulary of, of that type of music. Because you can play the parts, and then when you want to improvise and get out of the part, you know you have no idea what to do. So dealing with the clavier and all that stuff, I started realizing that it was um, a system of ostinatos, holding ostinatos with two or three of my limbs, and then trying to free one of my limbs. Um, for example, you know when I started trying to do um, the clave with with my left foot. Um, so I would do, for example, the three-two clave, and then you have to figure out, okay, what are the the parts that go with that? You know, depending on wh where you're playing. So then the first thing is to get the feet going. And then what patterns are available to you for the right hand? So then you start slow. So those are those are the main ostinatos that you have to to deal with if you're gonna deal with uh, uh, with Afro-Cuban music, um, and then you can uh, start applying that in the different ways to try to to start improvising a little bit with that. So the first step was to displace, you know, my left hand, little by little, by an eighth note. You know, so then I would once I had the ostinatos going. So then you know you can cover all the subdivisions within the bar, and then you you, you can start complicating it as much as you want, doing more complicated ostinatos. But the cool thing about that was that it was all within the tradition of the music. So so you're studying history basically and independence at, at the same time. That's great, you know, and, and it's actually surprising to me that the approach was so systematic. I was thinking that you just kind of figured that you were good at it. And oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I it's, wish. It's, it's actually great to hear. It's like it gives me hope to, to yeah. Know, yeah, and, and, uh, <laughs> get there some, some and, and that was a, that was, I mean, it was not the first step, but, you know, that's very basic for you yeah. to be able to start kind of feeling free within within that. And then... After I started getting comfortable, then then I really started yes. trying to do extreme independence, where I would completely separate, like m my one limb to to the other three, or or keep the the, the two legs going, and then play a different tempo, uh, on top. You know yeah. those yeah. those kinds of things. Right, right, right. Um, 
yeah that's 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 so so great to hear um so i had another question uh uh, uh and this is may- maybe a little more conceptual <coughs> question about rhythm in general you know it's a question that i like to ask a lot when i talk to drummer friends and percussionists uh is this idea of how we actually how how we feel rhythm and how we well uh, conceptualize it internally and how we project it of course as a drummer and as musicians we're like projecting rhythm all the time when we play right be it if we play out of time we play in time etc cetera, etc cetera. um but there's also um uh besides the conceptual idea of like being able to understand like uh, kind of what you were doing on the snare now just playing quarter notes eight notes triplets 16 notes right so subdivisions of one two three four to the beat to a pulse um also uh there are there are things that we're gonna like more than other things that are gonna be more naturally appealing right and uh, and and physically and easier. physically like they're yep. just gonna feel better yep. right um and of course uh, as a drummer this is the kind of thing that, that that you do all the time um but one thing i like to think about a lot like especially in this this the the case of something that, that feels good or 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 uh, or, or we kind of gravitate towards something more naturally uh and just by playing together you know there there are things that that you play and I, I recognize this is like your language right the way like you play a triplet or you organize like you know triplets in certain figures and you play a figure a figure and then you you ex- you slow it down or play it faster and different subdivisions um so i was going to i guess my question is like how, you know, how conceptual is this for you or has it has been over time versus something that just kind of came naturally just from like the music you were listening to, be it, you know, some of the rock, initial kind of rock influences or when you started getting into uh, uh, Caribbean music and, and Afro-Cuban music and eventually jazz music and listening to all this amazing, really advanced musicians and drummers, you know, in, in imparting all this information. So how... How, because that for me, I like to think of I like to think of it myself is always kind of a combination of like stuff that just kind of feels good and natural versus like like the theory, right? Like you kind of understand the theory is like okay, so if this works, this that means that this is also going to work, kind of like right. that. So how how much of it was for you, what was it for you like on one side or the other? I I, I think it was always a little bit of, of both. You know, for a while I didn't want to play anything that wasn't jazz, so that I could really you know, immerse myself completely into that language. But then after a while, I started realizing, man, I have all this richness from before that a lot of jazz drummers don't have. You know, not every jazz drummer started playing rock. Not every jazz drummer went through the whole Afro-Cuban thing and Latin music thing. Uh, With you, you know, with your band, we used to play a, a lot of stuff based on the Puerto Rican rhythms. With Danilo Perez, I would play stuff based on Panamanian rhythms. Uh, I would play with Venezuelans at school, Joropo and Onda Nueva, and then with Brazilians, all the richness they have. So all of that, you know, I had it in me. So then it was just a matter of making a composite of of all the things that I could do and that I liked and that were easy for me and kind of turn it into into my own language. So for a while, you know, you're searching and searching and searching and searching and then the more you play and the more especially original music you play i think when you're playing with with artists that are challenging you challenging you constantly with original difficult complex deep music you know you you start drawing from all those things and all of a sudden you know uh, i've always been drawn to backbeats you know because of rock so all of a sudden like oh well i I can, you know, get in my backbeat sometimes in the weirdest places and, you know, it kind of ties it all together. You know, so, um, for example, when I started playing with the Pat Metheny group, that was one thing that was very helpful, you know, that I had, I did all the rock stuff and then we could do like a straight note, but we're kind, we were kind of playing bebop, but without the walking bass line. But interacting like if it was bebop, and then all of a sudden I could also play backbeat. So it was really cool to do all those things at the same time. And sometimes it was conscious, and then sometimes it just started happening uh, by playing a lot with a bunch of different people. I think. Yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. Um, I want to invite Rachel Fraser, who's here, a good friend. How about it for Rachel? <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, One of the things that's very cool about these events is just 
having these conversations with some of the folks here from the from the institute and and kind of I mean I, of course I know Rachel from before and we had countless conversations about music and everything else just like most of us here who know each other and known each other for for a while. Um, Rachel's also a musician like like a lot of people here, which is kind of mind blowing too. Uh, um, but something that we were talking, we were just talking the, the last couple of days about what what to uh, connect about for this specific event, and uh, and we were talking about music and 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 kind of wellness, you know, and like kind of like the the positive effects or music or the effects of music. That could be another way to say it. Um, so I was wondering, and I know you also you also work with music 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 therapy, musical therapy, and 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 I was wondering if maybe we could start there. You could tell us what that is. And what kind of practice that involves, uh, and then we could kind of bounce from that. Absolutely, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, awesome. Um, that was louder. I'm just want to say I'm really grateful to be here. First of all, this is actually like this program is the reason I'm here at Columbia. So I'm just really grateful that we're actually being able to have this conversation. Um, thank you, Paula <laughs> and Mike. Um, but yeah, so music therapy is actually how I got interested in neuroscience in the first place. I was really fascinated by the idea that music could be healing and that could actually have really positive effects, but didn't really understand how it worked. Um, and then as I did research on it, I realized that a lot of people don't understand how it works fully and like don't understand the mechanisms and the neurobiology behind it. So that actually inspired me to um, study neuroscience and do neuroscience research and why I ended up applying to this program. Um, but I actually ended up majoring in music and studying a lot of music healing on the communal level, but also the individual level. Um, so I never fully got a music therapy degree because I realized that that was a lot of work. Um, I have a lot of respect for music therapists because the work that they do is truly amazing. Um, but it's not fully legitimized yet, I think, in, in a lot of areas. People don't, are they're like, oh, you're listening to music and you feel better, so cool. But there's so much more to that, and it's so much more about um, realizing what the individual needs and how they need to be healed and um, what kind of traumas they might have and things like that and how you can specifically design like musical paradigms or musical treatments for them um, to help their specific needs. So it can be paired up with pretty much any type of um, occupational therapy, any type of physical therapy, um, psychotherapy. You can pair music with that to make it more effective and to actually um, target like different areas of the brain and engage lots of different parts of the brain at the same time and um, bring up positive memories that can help people with um, dealing with trauma or things like that but you have to be really careful because you don't want to bring up traumatic memories so it's actually very like um, it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of really getting to know your patient one-on-one -on -one and individual care um, which is something that I think we're we need more of in this world um, and then, yeah, that's like on the f on the individual level, but then when it comes to communities and things like that, music can really bring people together in such beautiful ways. And I think y'all were talking about like live streaming concerts and things like that, which were really important for the COVID times because, and even now, um, because a lot of musicians and people who just enjoy being together and like, Music, like literally when you're sitting here together and listening to the same beats, like our heart rates can sync up, our breath rates can sync up and things like that. So we can like, there's a lot of neurobiological changes that are probably happening when that happens that can um, just cause like the feeling of togetherness and um, community that I think we were missing a lot of. So, yeah. That's that's so awesome. So an another thing that we were talking about that I think will be will be interesting to discuss also with Antonio and kind of connected to a lot of the things that, that we were talking about already um, is this idea, of course, with, with uh, music therapy, a lot of it, uh, 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 as, as I understand it, is like music that's already kind of being recorded. So you have a recording or you have a, a piece of music that's like gonna, gonna like hit a certain spot or create a certain effect in, a, in, a, in, a, in an individual. Um, but you know, a lot of what we do as musicians uh, it's like we create kind of music in the in the moment, right? So we we're like like now we're playing for you guys and you're listening and um, and uh, even if we consciously or, or unconsciously do it, we're trying to communicate something when we play, right? Um, so I think it, it, it another thing that I was thinking about when we when we were preparing for this was this idea of like what what it is what is it that we're trying to communicate, right? I mean, this is something. Do we are we trying to make the listener feel what we feel, or are we trying or or or, or not? Or we're we just trying to to put some something out there that's gonna create some kind of feeling, and of course that feeling might be super subjective, 
depending on the person, depending on, on the way they feel that day or the kind of music they've been exposed to or whether they're enjoying the music or not or whether they're feeling good or not. Um, I'm wondering if that's something that that's connected to what you're ta- what you're talking about, and I would love to hear Antonio's point of view because I know that I mean we're talking about storytelling before and connecting with the listener, which is a big deal for you, I'm sure. And, and I know I'm, I'm not sure I know. Uh, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, Rachel. Absolutely. Um, I think when it comes to when you're creating music and the intention behind it, I think it's really important also um, what the intention is behind it because a lot of times. It, music really does affect us. Like we talk a lot about the positive, I talk a lot about the positive effects of music, but it can be um, negative and things like that as well. So depending on the, I guess, intent of the artist, it can have different effects on the on the listener for sure. Um, and at, in some sense, I feel like we can tell when there are musicians who are really like really great at storytelling and really great at like actually communicating with their audience, even if they're not, physically communicating with them but they can read the audience and read like the reactions that they're having and play along and um they can tell if it's going well or if it's not going well and kind of adjust based on that i don't have as much experience with that as both of you probably do have but um i'm very like visual i always like analyze when i see artists and and what the audience is kind of doing in response to that um i definitely think it's related to the idea of healing because if i think if you're sitting up here playing something and not really pay, not really caring about what other people think that's not necessarily um connecting with them and they can feel that I, I think sometimes we can feel that when we're listening to a piece of music um so there's one thing of like listening to a recording and saying like oh this is really great and sometimes you can hear a recording think that they're speaking to you uh directly which is great but when you're like actually there in person i think there's that like feedback that feedback loop of like being able to see the reactions and then adjust accordingly and I think that can be even more healing sometimes. Yeah, and that's actually a really good point. And I would love to hear Antonio's uh, thought on this this idea of like um, um, with, whether whether or not the intent from the musician is actually to to uh, to send a, a vibe or not. And 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 also going back to this, I mean, see, we're talking about live streaming and stuff like that. That's obviously one of the things that we miss as musicians and and, I'm, I'm, and, and as audiences. This idea of like being in the same room where the music is actually happening. And even if it's not, you know, even if you're not clapping after every note we play, there's like that invisible sort of energy that we feel and that you feel from from the performers as well. Um, and Antonio, you were saying something earlier about storytelling and, I, and it felt to me like in a way like you were talking about, okay, I'm gonna send something out there and then I'm gonna kind of guide you through the idea or the development or, or of the piece or the improvisation. I'm sure this is something you think about a lot when you perform the connection to the act, at the audience when you listen to music too. So maybe you could give us your perspective too. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to unpack in, in, with this subject now because, uh, well, to begin with, if you if you apply it to just sheer communication with the uh, with the audience, then I mean, it's two completely different things. If you're singing a song, you know, with lyrics that you're trying to you know put out there and you know, you're telling a story already. So you can take that story in many different ways. It can be very subjective lyrics. They can be very literal, but you know, that's one level. Then another level is when you play instrumental music, and then another level is when you're improvising instrumental music. Um, You know, do I think of what do I want to convey, like literally, oh, I'm feeling sad, so I want people to feel sad. No, it's not like that, you know. Uh, It's like, I have something, I have no idea what, what it's gonna be tonight, you know, that I'm, it's gonna come out. And to me, that's the cool thing, because if you have a preconceived idea of what you're gonna put out there, then you're already missing out on, on, on the magic of what it could be if you just kind of let the music do what it needs to do. And I don't know if it ha- has happened to you or, or to any of you, sometimes the best gigs I've had are when I'm exhausted, sick, tired, fed up, where I'm like, ugh, I just want this to be over. And I don't put any extra effort. I don't force things. I just like kind of let it be and just do the minimum necessary. And all of a sudden, the music guides me to this other place that, you know, uh, I find myself forcing, you know, my energy into the music a lot of times. 
you know and it, and it's a i think it's a constant struggle that improvisers have you know how much do you propose and how much do you impose you know so always you're you're going to have to throw out, out ideas out there uh, but you know how much it's is too much and how little is too little so all these things all these micro decisions that you are making in the moment to me that's where all the the magic is right. you know the all the ethereal all the subjectiveness of what you're doing that that's when it starts coming out you know so when i improvise yeah i try to to guide the audience in a way that um You know, I don't, I don't want, I don't, I don't want to dumb it down. I, d I just want to make it really clear. Clear. It's about you know, it's, it's like if you know, if I'm talking to you about improvisation at Columbia University, but scrambled eggs are fantastic. I love them in the morning. What the hell is that, right? <laughs> you know, people are like, okay, <laughs> how did you go from that to this? And my theory is that you can talk about both things. The thing is, how are you going to transition from one idea to the next? Mm -hmm. You know, and how smooth that transition is going to be, which is going to make it ma make sense. So, you know, this morning I knew I had to come to Columbia University and do this thing with you, and I was starving. I had some scrambled eggs. I didn't feel too well, you know, so I lied down for a little bit. Luckily, I feel better now, and here I am. <laughs> you know, so I, I transitioned from one thing to, you know. So it is possible. Uh, but So that's what I'm trying to do when I play. Uh, I can start playing the simplest rock beat and then end up playing the most complex polyrhythm mm. and if i got from a to z you know the right way you guys will hopefully will have followed me through right. through the the trip but if i just and and that's usually the mark of an uh, uh an unexperienced improv uh, improviser that you have no patience to establish things. So then you're like, oh my God, it's getting boring, it's getting boring. And then you change to something else and then you feel like you are just like this crazy person on your instrument because you have no idea how long you can sustain something before the audience absorbs, absorbs it and then move on to the next thing. So to me, that's, that's uh, always the most fascinating aspect of improvisation, the pacing and how you're gonna allow that other thing that we have no idea what it is to come out and guide us through what, what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you talked about uh, experience and pacing and these things that come with time and, and just repetition and just doing things over and over. Uh, but then, Rachel, you mentioned something that was that was also really interesting uh, to me, uh, as this idea that, you know, as an audience member, we've all, I mean, even musicians, we've all been audience members, right? And we kind of feel something when, when an energy, an energy is being sent out. I mean, we can tell like sometimes, okay, the so band might not be super into it tonight or like, you know, the bass player looks bored or or maybe the pianist is like looking the other way is like, or like, you know, he's playing something or, you know, there's certain things that come out of the music, even listen to a record, you know, like if, if you're not listening live, there's some certain energy that comes out of the music, but also for musicians uh, from the other side is, is, is sort of the same, right? I mean, sort of the same that you, you kind of feel the audience out you know uh and 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 even from audience to audience you know you you kind of you know you develop certain things that you know kind of work in a certain way right it's almost like having like devices you say okay so this is kind of like like you know if if i need something like this i know i can do this right if you need like energy mm -hmm. if you need to be like pace things down or have a, like less things so uh, in a way it's kind of like a back and forth but it's also I feel super duper like subjective because it's so personality based. I, I mean, uh, if I may interrupt, yeah. uh, the thing is there are so many external factors with everything that we're doing. So, you know, these are not my drums. These are not my cymbals. You know, I feel a, leaven, uh, a level of discomfort, you know, that, you know, when I'm at home with all my, and nobody's listening to me, that's you know i'm i'm very comfortable and then you put a couple of people listening and then you start getting a little more uncomfortable and then you play with somebody else and you know in a place and you know i don't like the lights you know it's too much and you know the, the drums sound a little strange and the pedal feels weird you know so it's all these external factors that are always like just talking to you 
Um, and to me, the, the best improvisers are the ones that are comfortable with that. You know, you're totally comfortable with the idea that you're going to be a mess. <laughs> you're going to be nervous and you're going to be a wreck and you're going to be uh, in discomfort most of the time. But how you harness that discomfort and then how you translate it into something else that, because I can assure you what I'm playing in these drums uh, is very different than I would play with my drums because I, I'm not entirely comfortable here. So then that makes some other stuff come out mm -hmm. that normally maybe wouldn't. You wouldn't come out with your drums. Exactly. So, okay. and, and also when you're talking about an audience, you know, how comfortable are you guys, you know, uh, with the lighting, with the sound, uh, you know, with the temperature of the room, everything influences how you perceive something. So it's going to influence how we put it out there. It's going to influence how you guys get it. And then it's gonna influence how we get it back from you. Right. You know, it's, it's just so many layers of, of unknowns yeah. that are always happening. And you know, you, with experience, you learn how to deal with those things the best you can. But I don't know if it has happened to you. Sometimes you played one of the best gigs you've played and the audience is dead. Yeah. And then sometimes you kind of just, you know, had a bunch of mistakes and blah, 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 and the audience goes crazy. Yeah. And then sometimes the bass player thought that the gig sucked, and I thought that was amazing. You know, so it's, it's just so subjective yeah. how people are receiving all that data, yeah. you know, constantly. And, you know, that's to me, that's, <laughs> that, that's why it's so fascinating, this thing. And again, to your point, uh, a lot of it has to do with. I mean, you said experience, which of course is true, but it's it's really about just kind of like expecting things to be different every time, in a way, right? You might, I mean, as a, as a drummer, of course, you don't travel. Most drummers don't travel with their set, you know, where they can go travel from from concert to concert. So you kind of expect a different set, or maybe a little different every time. The audience is going to be a little different. The sound is going to be a little different. The reaction, the musicians might play different every night. So after a while, you get used to the idea of like things like the unexpected. Right? Exactly. Like, okay. the, the X factor is yeah. always, right. and, and there's so many things out of your control, yeah. you know, that you kind of have to, I think, the great improvisers make peace with that, and then you can just be yourself. But one thing that is fascinating um, is what, if we're going to talk about uh, time, mm -hmm. right? Because time is, you know, the thing that kind of is the glue between everything that we're trying to do. Like pulse, you mean? like Yeah, pulse. pulse. Yeah. 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 So one of the most interesting things that I've experienced is when I've done gigs where I'm playing with a click track, you know, because that's one thing that is always the same, right? The drums are different, the sound is different, the audience is different, but the click is the same. So a click track, for those of you who might not, uh, so a click track is like having like a, a metronome, metronome in your ears, kind of going like it's used for a lot of like pop music, for yeah. example. I mean, in my, my present yeah. band, right. my present project, right. because we play with tracks also, then 95% of the gig is with a click. So you have a metronome yeah, going, so everyone's so we, following we use the same inner monitors click. and uh, and and you know the click is there every night. It's exactly the same tempo every tune, and every day it feels absolutely different. Like it's so slow this today, tomorrow. It's, it's going to feel so fast. One day it feels just right. you know. So that is, is to me the most interesting manifestation of how our organism is absolutely a different animal every day. And, and that's the one thing in these kinds of gigs that yeah, you're, playing, you're trying to play the same music, you're dealing with the same band, different uh, PA, different everything, different sound, but the click, the metronome is the same. And it feels wildly different from one day to the to the next, and and uh, learning how to deal with that is another you know science altogether. You know, when I I'm really excited, you know, because I want to play, everything feels slow, and I feel like I'm just on top of the of the beat all the time. And and some days when I'm tired, it just feels like I'm I'm trying to catch up, and and it's a uh, it's it's a whole world just. You know the 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 time thing, mm -hmm. the yeah. tempos. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, I want to kind of open it up and see if anyone has any questions 
before we play another piece, maybe to close it out. I know we usually get some really cool questions from first row right here. <laughs> yes. I spent Uh, we can hear it. Uh, we'll repeat the question. The, the question is uh, the advantages or disadvantages of using the click. Well, uh, consistency, for sure. You know, um, sometimes when you're playing certain kinds of music, I, th I think it's good to have, you know, at least a good starting point. Uh, some sometimes what I'll do with my band, for example, is just have a count off. So I hear in my ears, clap, 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 clap. And then I know that's where I need to start. And then if we speed up, fine. But that's a good starting point. If if I have a lot of energy, maybe I'll I'll feel like I'm playing the right tempo and then I listen back and I'm like rushing so much because, you know, X, Y, and Z are in the audience and my mom is there and I'm excited and, and then that changes everything, how I feel everything. So then the metronome is, is useful in, in terms of consistency and then also if you're playing with tracks, obviously with a computer that is firing different sounds and stuff like that, then, then that, that's why you do it. And to be honest, when you're playing certain kinds of music, like you know what we just played, I would obviously not want to have a, a click track in there, a uh, metronome. But certain kinds of, of music, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's nice to have that consistency night, night after night so that uh, the message you're trying to, to give to the audience is the right one. Because if you're playing it way too fast or way too slow, then that's going to change the perception of how you guys are going to get the material that I wrote that maybe, you know, I, it kind of needs to be within a certain tempo for it to actually work. That that's one thing, and and I wanted to add also, like uh, for recording type of studio situations, like uh, especially for a lot of music oh, yeah. that's recorded in layers, like a lot of popular music, for example. So you'll record like the bass first, and then the drums, and then the piano, and then the vocals, and then the horns. So like everyone will be playing to the same click, and and you know someone might be in L.A., someone might be in Australia, or whatever. Especially these days, like the way things are being done. So the click is really helpful. Um, and and uh, also in a lot of instances, I know I know uh, uh, Pat does some of this too. People would have the click kind of move within the song, so it feels natural. So it'll speed up at some point, it'll slow down at some point. Some point, if it's rubato, it'll be like a slower tempo. But everyone's playing to it. So even if it feels like it's slowing down, speeding up, th everyone's still following the same. And, and also one great thing about that in the studio is that you make you know you record five takes and they're all exactly the same tempo, even if you do that. So then, you know, if I like the head of the first uh, take, but I really like the bridge of the fifth take, then I can just splice it together and it totally works. Otherwise, you know, um, it, it can uh, editing can be a lot more difficult if, if you don't play with a, with a click. Other questions? Yes, <laughs> gentlemen, the first row. I have no idea. That's the fascinating thing. Yeah, sorry. The, the, the question was the, the balance between imposing and proposing your will, your musical will, on, onto the music and onto others. Uh, as a drummer, is, is, you, know, you have a lot of power in this instrument. You can, you can destroy the band in two seconds if, if, you, if you put your mind into it. And, I, and I've done plenty, believe me. So I'm trying to, to um, rectify my old ways. And, and I'm trying to, to be as much as I can a team player, but I also don't want it to get stagnant. I hate it when, when I go to see gigs and nothing happens. You know, to me, that's the most boring thing, um, especially jazz gigs, when everybody's just kind of an automatic pilot and somebody is uh, uh, soloing and then everybody's kind of playing behind. Uh, to me, that's just death. You know, it's so boring. So what, what the way I try to think about what you asked is I, I 
kind of think of myself as a beautiful Persian rug. You know, so I have to lay something. Uh? <laughs> no, 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 because if it's an ugly Persian rug, you're not going to want to, you know, stand on it. So, so it has to be lush, it's got to be beautiful, it's got to be gorgeous, and then the band is going to be like, oh man, this, I'm going to take off my shoes, you know, and then take off my socks, and then you, ah, this feels great. So after a while that the musicians are standing on my rug, then what I love to do is just like, eh, just pull it a little bit, <laughs> you know, so they go like, oh, wait a minute, what, something, and then, because to me, it's, it's all about, you know, keeping the radar up all the time and, and doing, you know, throwing things at each other. So to me, my rug has to always be there, but then I'm yanking it a little bit here and a little bit there constantly to make people react to it. And then sometimes, you know, you get overly excited and you do too much. And then sometimes you go the other way, you do too little and then the music kind of uh, gets a little boring. So, I mean, the balance is just something that I'm always trying to, to find. And it's, you know, that's the billion dollar question. How do you balance that? On a, with each gig being totally different, everybody feeling differently, the audience being different, the, the plays being different, you feeling different. So all those things are, you know, uh, a source of constant, uh, you know, research. You know, as uh, for you as a as an improviser, how how do you balance that? And and listening to yourself is very useful. You know, recording the the gig and then being like, oh my god. I thought I was sounding great on this and you know it's just so rushing too much or it's dragging or it's just too much I'm I'm doing too much or I'm doing too little you know so th those things are very informative because in the heat of the moment you know you you think you're doing something and and sometimes the energy is fooling you into into doing something else I kind of wanted to ask a question if that's okay about like that ineffable energy that you both are referring to like when you're playing and that kind of takes over sometimes and like the vibe of the room and how there's so many variables <coughs> that can change on like in an instant depending on like the temperature or, like any of that kind of stuff do you think it's possible to measure that or to figure out like what is going on there to like make put that into an experimental paradigm or something like that or do you think it's even worth it to do that or do you like is it more valuable just kind of being ineffable and being unable to describe? I think it would be worth it to measure it. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I it's possible. Some, some of you guys, some of you I think it would be a huge that. mistake to measure it. <laughs> <laughs> tell us more. <laughs> I, I honestly think it would be worth it just for the sake of like knowing what's going on, you know. But I, I, I see where you're going with this, though. Um, yeah, it's like, you know, if you like sausages, man, you don't want to know what's inside <laughs> there. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I think if, if you start uh, microanalyzing every little thing, it, 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 I think it can lose a little bit of, of the magic. But at the same time, when, for example, I've seen shows where they have uh, a, either a sports person or, or a, an artist, a musician, usually just think about what they do. You know, if I sit and I think about playing the drums without moving my hands or my feet, the, the, the brain fires the same way, you know, and I can totally feel myself playing even though I'm not doing it. So, of course, that, that kind of stuff is, is fascinating to me. Uh, I used to do uh, gymnastics when I was younger and every day before I meet, before a competition, I would go through the routines and I would be in bed sweating, <laughs> you know, stressed out of, you know, my mind just because my brain is putting me in the competition already with all those variables that I don't know what it's going to be, what it's what I'm going to feel like. And and inevitably, you know, and the drums, I, I, I the drums are a friend enough of mine that I know I'm going to be okay. So no matter how bad it is, I, I, I can manage. But in gymnastics, that was not the case. And every little variable, you know, could make me go tumble, you know, off the pommel horse on my head, you know. So 
that's the level of, of comfort that, you know, as a gymnast, you need to have in order to make a routine every single time. So, you know, you can equate all this, these things to a bunch of different things. And man, it's, it's just fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think we had a question right here. That's a great question. So the, the question is um, uh, specifically about creating music. Um, and when, when you're in the process of creating music with another musician, where th does the inspiration come and how do we connect and the synergy and, and how does that happen? I mean, it's, it's a great question. In many ways, we don't, we don't really know like an exact answer. answer. It could vary from person to person. I'm sure Antonio would have some insight of his own. I feel like specifically in the kind of scenario that we're on now for this for for today and the kind of music we're playing which is music that's that involves a lot of creativity and a lot of personality like you're basically injecting the music with your own personality but always not always but i guess in the case of today is within a, a context right in this case it's the context of playing together a duo which is not customary right that's usually like a harmonic instrument or bass or piano or something like that but also uh, within a framework of a, of a song or a piece of music, like the piece of music we played, uh, the first mus piece we played is a piece, is this song, well-known jazz song called Inner Urge by a saxophonist Joe Anderson. We've played it before and we kind of know a form and we know what's happening. We know there's a certain amount of bars and a certain harmonic framework and a melody. So well, we, we don't kind of know it. We, well, we know really it. know we, it. We know it. We know it well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we know it enough we to play it. We have to really know it. Yeah. Um, so, so my point is that we are improvising and we're kind of making up things, but it's always like within the context of information we already know, right? Um, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. I'm, I'm totally yeah, I mean, the, the structure, you know, you, you need to have, you know, it's like you have the house and then you can furnish it any way you want. But if you don't have a house, then, you know, where are you going to put your furniture? To me, that's kind of the, that, you know. Does that ring a bell for you, Rachel? Feel the same way? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, but but it's it's again so subjective, you know, because you can play with. I played with world-renowned musicians, and I just don't feel the chemistry, you know. And then I play with other people that it's it's automatic, you know, it's immediate and and usually when you feel the pulse, especially the pulse. To me, that's the glue, you know, the, the time. If you feel the time and more or less in the same place, then that's you, you've taken care of 90% of, of the battle. If you really feel it in two different places, that's what ha has happened that I played with, you know, legends, you know, jazz legends that I just, you know, feel it in such a different place that it's a constant struggle to try to adjust and find common ground. Um, so, to me, if you, if you feel that pulse more or less in the same place, that's uh, where where the magic starts to happen. I feel. Yeah. And and to to that point, um, a lot of it uh, is is getting used to playing with someone a bunch, you know, and just kind of. I mean, it's not like you know what they're gonna do, but it's there's a certain familiarity that that you know you always feel comfortable. You know, you always feel like you're speaking the same language. You're in the same zone. Uh, even if it's something complex or if it's something that's with a lot of energy, you always feel comfortable because it's like you know that that person is going to be able to take what you're going to give them and, yeah. and vice versa. Trust. So is that. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's also trust. just like a lot of social dynamics and intricacies in right. every performance and whenever you see a band together, like you don't know how well they know each other, how many times they play together or like what the dynamics are and things like that. And sometimes little things could be said right before the gig that make people like you can tell that yeah I every once in a while like when someone introduces someone and they do it in a way that like maybe isn't very um welcoming or they'll just say something like oh so and so so and so significant other and then there you can see the energy just kind mm. of die and it's really sad to see that sometimes um but yeah it can really like kill the vibe of, mm -hmm. the, of the entire performance especially for that one like maybe one specific artist but that can bring down sometimes the mm -hmm. entire synergy of the the whole performance yeah, and, and I'm always um, like an advocate for really thinking things through 
of what you're going to present to your audience. Mm -hmm. You know, I think jazz is awesome because it's whatever happens, happens, but sometimes to a fault. And, and the audience kind of gets lost because the, the musicians are so into their, what they're doing inside and you know i'm awesome and i'm playing all this incredible stuff and they're not really worrying about how people are perceiving it and also how you're going to pace the set you know what you're going to say to the audience when you're going to say it all those things uh, to me are because i started listening to rock and roll you know i never used to see pl uh, people reading music when they play And then all of a sudden, everybody's reading music and jazz, you know, and I hated it, <laughs> you know, and I understand, you know, that, you know, jazz can be so complex and sometimes you don't know you don't have enough rehearsal time. But, you know, one thing that we usually do uh, that I love that Miguel does every time we're going to play, he, I rarely see, see you with music, you know, so that shows that there's already a level of understanding of the material that allows you to completely go into a different level. If you're struggling with the, the, the music or you're still reading it, that means that you know it in a, in a more superficial level than if you really have it ingrained in your head, I feel. Mm -hmm. And its essence also, like jazz started with just listening and playing right. what you listen. I mean, all, all music. All really. music, yeah, <laughs> and communication. Um, yes, one more question, Paula? Yeah, just music. Okay. Okay, I mean, we'll be around and we can talk up through. I think we want to play one more piece before we run out of time. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you, Antonio, for being such an amazing friend and musician and being here. Thank you, man. Thanks for the invitation. So we're going to close it out with a piece by Antonio, which is a lot of fun to play, and we've been playing it for, for years now, actually. Uh, this is called Challenge Within. And he's yeah, the, the, this tune is so that you guys can follow along. It's basically a blues. It's a 12-bar blues, uh, but it's in 5-4. And it's uh, a lot of people, when you say 5-4, you think of, like, take five, kind of 5-4. But this is with, with a clave. So... And it's a it's a long four, so you, uh, long five. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two. So that's that's the main structure. And then we play a blues within that. It has a little bit of a an interlude where we slow down uh, on purpose. And then you know it's a, it's a fun tune because. I, I feel like the blues is such a common form that you don't have to think about it too much, but then I always like to add something that makes you have to think, which is the 5-4 and the club. So this is called Challenge Within. Thank you. 
Oh my goodness. I have chills. <laughs> Please give it up one more time for Miguel Zanon, Antonio Sanchez, and of course, and of course, Rachel Fraser. We hope we'll see you in June for our next event. Uh, and those of us who are in the room, please stick around. We'll have a little more conversation afterwards. Thank you so much.